Amen. Amen. Thank you for leading us in those songs that so appropriately capture the life, death, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news for sinners, and the reminder that it always, it has, it has not always been obvious or apparent to generations what God's plan is for sinners. Five truths that shape the Christian life. Five truths that were captured coming out of an event 500 years ago, October 31st, 1517. So this coming October 31st, 500 years ago, an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther inadvertently set the world ablaze in the recovery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what I want us to do this morning, and we'll be going for the next six Sundays, this will take us into the first Sunday in November. And then the second Sunday in November, we will, we will reflect upon the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. But the, from this Sunday into, I believe it's November the 5th, we will think upon the Reformation. We read Isaiah 58 earlier. You will be called the restorer of walls, the repairer of the breach. That is, that's the work of reformation. We are, whether you realize it or not, reformers. We operate on the battle cry, the church reformed and always reforming. Turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 6 verses 16 to 19 as we think today under this overarching theme five truths that shape the Christian life why the Reformation matters why take six Sundays away from our consecutive expositions through 1 Corinthians to reflect upon this theme Jeremiah 6, verses 16 to 19. I hope that you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you because we want you to see the Word of God. There's something very powerful about seeing it and hearing it at the same time. There's something powerful about seeing it, hearing it, and saying it at the same time. It has something to do with your retention of it. And stand with me if you would and follow along as I read this text. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. I set watchmen over you saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not pay attention. Therefore hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I hope you recognize that in the reading of this, that it's just a brief snapshot of the day in which we live. Why study the Reformation? Because we live in post-modern, post-Christian, pre-Reformation America. Thank you. Please be seated. I don't know if you had this experience. I, when I was a little boy entering first grade, we had these standardized forms that we had to fill out the first day of school. You remember those? Any of you remember? Uh, you had to write your name in the little squares. Remember that? 
My name was William Wallace Askell. There were never enough squares for my name. I would get William easily enough. I'd get Wallace heading into that, and I would realize I could count A-S-C-O-L. There's not going to be enough letters at the end of this for my last name. And it caused no small perplexity for me, and I would ask my teachers, what do I need to do? I can't get my whole name. Any of you deal with that? But there was also on this standardized form, if you remember, religious preference. Now, that, I'm sure that's anathema today. You, you don't ask someone their religious preference. But that, you did. And I had three boxes, Catholic, Protestant, other. My mother taught me, getting me ready for these things now. Not wanting me to mark the wrong box. Sat down, I remember it, sat down with me and said, now you're going to be asked to fill out a form. And it's going to say Catholic, Protestant, and other. We're not Catholic, she said. We're not Protestant. We never protested anything. You mark other, and you write Baptist out beside it. Any of you had to, are you familiar with any of that at all? I, and so I did. And she would teach me, because, you know, we go back to Jesus who was baptized by John the Baptist. That's where we trace our, our roots back. We don't come out of some denominations. And that sounded plausible. What I, what I realized years later was that my mother, bless her heart, was influenced by the, by the trail of blood mentality written by J.M. Carroll that basically said Baptists trace our heritage back to John the Baptist who baptized Jesus. So John the Baptist and Jesus were the first Baptists and anything other than that's a deviation. Now what I learned as I began to study church history was to get there, you've got to go through some strange folks that all we had in common with them is that, we, that they immersed and we immersed. Some of them taught that Mary had celestial flesh. And I won't go into the whole list, but anyway, I, I began to learn this. And what I discovered was, and I'm so grateful for my history professor Tom Nettles in seminary, what I discovered was that we actually come from several strands of church history. That we are heirs of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. That we do identify with much of the teachings, the recovery of the gospel that came out of that. That we are heirs of the Anabaptists, called that because, because they rejected their, their infant sprinkling and realized the scriptures taught that baptism was an act of immersion upon professing believers. That we are heirs of the Puritans, and so very grateful to him. And I do believe now, my mother was close, but I do believe that when you talk about the Protestant Reformation, and we are heirs of the Protestant Reformation, God bless you, Mama, I know you know that now, uh, that we Baptists are the only thorough reformers. I love my brothers and sisters in other communions, Presbyterians, we've had that conversation through the years, I love them. But only Baptists have brought the teachings of the Reformation to their biblical conclusions. We'll deal with that a little more tonight, Sola Scriptura, and then next Sunday morning as we preach on it. And so we are heirs. Today, if I were filling out that little form, I would check Protestant, I would check other, and I would write Baptist, parenthesis, Anabaptist, comma, Puritan. And I'm sure that would mess everybody up because there's no place to put all that in their little forms and they plug them in. But I mean, now that I know, I do it right, okay? October 31st, 1517. Ten years after performing his first communion that I, that I referenced a while ago when we were celebrating the Lord's Supper, after he found himself trembling, holding what he thought was the blood of Christ in the chalice. Ten years after that, he'd had ten years to study. Ten years to pour over the scriptures that were only accessible to the priesthood, not accessible to the people. It was against the law. In fact, I want to commend to you, I want you to go to desiringgod.org, or you can send me a note, and I'll send you the link to a 31-day devotional 
that's been prepared to study heroes short biographical sketches as a devotional basis through the month of October, heroes of the Reformation. And the first one you'll read about is, is uh, Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, morning star of the Reformation. Published the Bible into English, was against the law. You could be burned. In fact, they were so angry that after he, he didn't, they didn't get to kill him, he died. And so when they were judging another later on, years later, they went and dug up Wycliffe's bones and burned his bones and sprinkled them in the river Swift as a heretic for publishing the Bible in English. It was not accessible to the people. In Wycliffe's day, and even still in Luther's day. So here he is, 10 years later. He has studied the theologies, the Catholic canons, the writings of Holy Mother Church, and he studied the scriptures, and he finds them to be at great odds with one another. So much so that in the fashion of the day, he had detailed 95 complaints or 95 positions of departure where he found that the scriptures teach this but the church wrongly teaches this. He took his 95 theses, as they were called, propositions, and as any good scholar would do in his day, he nailed it on the door of the church at Wittenberg, Germany. It would be like, uh, that's where you would have put your notice that we're going to have a church-wide fellowship meal. You just nail it to the door there and say, that's next Sunday. Remember now, bring your potluck. That's what you did there. You just nailed a notice to the door. And he was simply putting it up there, hoping somebody would see it and say, well, I, I, we need to talk about this perhaps. His students, however, got hold of it, had it printed, what had God provided for providentially in that time? Gutenberg's printing press. Had it mass printed and distributed and what Luther intended to be as a debate turned into a flashpoint for what we look back 500 years later now and look back and call it the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. Why does the Reformation matter today? Well, if you were here for the video on last Sunday evening, or if you've seen the the material, by the way, if, even if you weren't here for the video, you need to pick this up and look over it uh, for session one last Sunday evening. Two reasons were given by, by that panel. It's a great panel, by the way. You've got, you've got uh, Trevin Wax talking to uh, Dr. Albert Moeller, the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, uh, and Kevin DeYoung, who's a, who's a great uh, pastor, writer, theologian. They're just talking about these things. And they gave the answer to the question, why? Because it's our history and it's God's truth. Someone said years ago, if it was true then, speaking of God's word, it's true now because God's truth doesn't change with time. No matter how many people want to make it change, no matter how many people want to, want to be different, God's truth does not change. The truth unchanged, unchanging is our mantra when it comes to the scripture. Luther's great joy as he discovered the gospel in the scriptures. Remember, if you know about Luther, you know that, that initially when he read, the just shall live by faith, talking about the righteousness of God, that you need to attain the righteousness of God. This idea of the righteousness of God for him was unattainable. And at one point in his study, someone asked him, Dr. Luther, do you love God? And he said, love God? I hated God. That sounds strong, but that, that's Luther. Because he saw what God required and knew that he was not able. He climbed the steps to St. Peter's Basilica at one time, and on every step, kissing it, repenting of sin, asking for forgiveness, and all the way up the steps, when he got to the top, he stood and said, Now I am forgiven. But am I? He was fearful. Von Staupitz, who was his 
his confessor, he was to go to him and, and confess his sins, got so weary of Luther coming for these, for these tiny, minuscule things that he finally said to him one time, Luther, go out and send some sin worthy of confessing. That was the, that was the straitjacket he lived in. And so when he realized that the righteousness of God required of God, the holy God, was a righteousness that could be attained by faith. The just shall live by faith. He said it was like heaven opened to him. Paradise was opened unto him. And he had hope. And that becomes what we know as sola fide. We'll look at this in a couple of weeks. He discovered that you're saved. According to Scripture, you're saved by the grace of God alone, sola gratia, through faith alone, and some would say through Christ or in Christ alone. And it all happens in such a way that God alone gets the glory. My friend R.F. Gates, I've talked to you about him many times over the 12 years I've been here. My mentor, my, my, my fellow laborer in the gospel who taught me as much or more about the things of God than anyone I've ever been around, preached a message at the church I was pastoring about the glory of God and the salvation of a sinner. And he unpacked it in such a way, every aspect of it. He said, now who gets the glory for that? Does the sinner get the glory for that? Does the person to share the gospel get the glory? No. He said only God gets, it happened in such a way that only God gets the glory. Only God gets the glory. God alone is glorified in the salvation of a sinner. When a person's really saved, God is the one who gets the glory. Our text today, I want to point out a couple of things here. The reason the Reformation is so important is because we live in a generation that's very much like Jeremiah's generation where God has said, look Stop and look and ask, where are the old landmarks? Where are the ancient paths? We've gotten off the path. Where is it? It's a good way because it's God's way. Ask where it is. Discover it. And when you do, walk in it. And that was the admonition that Jeremiah the prophet gave to the people of his day on behalf of God. And their response was... We will not walk in it. Brothers and sisters, we live in that day in spades. Hugh Hefner, one of the vilest men to live in our lifetime, poisoned the minds of men and women and exploited women in a way not known before. Hugh Hefner died this past week and is being celebrated as a hero. A hero. And so in one more way, one more time, this generation says, we will not walk in the ways of God. But you know something? The church does that too. There are things that are very clear in Scripture on how God calls the church to be the church. And multitudes today who would identify with Christianity says, we will not walk in it. Just turn on your TV sometime and watch what's happening in what used to be the Houston Rockets Arena in Houston at Lakewood Church, where multiplied thousands of people gather to hear Joel Osteen spew his heresy. Or T.D. Jakes the potter's house. And on and on we could go. There's, there's no way I have time today to listen, list to you the modern heretics who are, who are followed. Paula White, who has the ear of President Donald Trump, a heretic. And so many professing Christians in America today say, we will not walk in those ways. So the prophet, speaking on behalf of God, says, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet, the, the, the call of the gospel. If the, if the trumpet is uncertain, the people will be confused when they're, when they're called to battle. Listen to the trumpet. They said, we will not pay attention. Look at God's response. Because it, 
I think it goes a long way to tell you where we are as a country. Not because I think America is, is some new Israel, but because America has the most gospel light, gospel mercies, gospel privileges of any nation in the history of the world. And therefore, we are subject to the most awesome judgment of God. God says, I'm bringing disaster upon this people. You know, it's hard. It's hard to cheer anymore, isn't it? You want to cheer those who stand up for traditional values and then out of their mouths come some of the most ridiculous things. It's hard for the people of God in America to have someone to cheer for. Disaster has come upon our country in ways that we never imagined. When I was filling out that little form in first grade, I never imagined that 60 years later I'd be watching what I'm watching. Brothers and sisters, why am I saying this? I'm a prophet of gloom and doom? No. I'm saying it because we need a recovery in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the principles that were recovered in the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago. This should mean something to us. If it's just dull church history, then I, I love you, but I'm going to tell you, you have been rocked to sleep in the cradle of complacency. Because they've not paid attention to my words. And my law, they've rejected my law. You see any of that around you today? There's, I don't have time to unpack this, but I was doing some reading on vacation. The next thing coming down the pike for us in the whole arena of, of sexuality and relationships is polyamory. Poly meaning many, several. Amory meaning love relationships. Where a man and a woman may be married, but the, the woman may have two or three other relationships that she invites into their home. The man may have two or three. They may be heterosexual. They may be homosexual. They may be lesbian. Just a, just a mixed bag. Because see, when you, when you have a Supreme Court that says you cannot define marriage, then Pandora's box is open and you cannot stop. You have no way to stop legally any relationship. So I read an article this week, is the church ready for polyamory? Because so-called evangelicals are touting it on the basis of Scripture. See, if, if we don't know our history, you know the adage, if you don't know histories, histories, truths, histories, errors, you are doomed to repeat its errors and you are helpless to defend against it and reject it. That's why I study the Reformation. So we can discover again what our authority is. It's sola scriptura. We can remember that salvation is by grace alone and thank God that it is. Thank God it's by grace alone. None would be saved otherwise. The salvation is through faith alone. Just simple childlike trust in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as God's only provision for salvation but God's willing and able provision of salvation who is able to save to the uttermost all who come to him by faith. That's by grace alone, through faith alone. It's in Christ alone. And only Christ. And he can be written off in this generation as a bigot. He can be written off uh, as short-sighted. He can be written off as exclusive. And on, and you can, and can throw every intemperate label at him you want, but he is the only way. No one comes to God the only God, the true and living God, not a God of our imagination, not a God of the false religions. No one comes to God except through the finished work of Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. And to recover those things and understand them and appreciate them again and cling to them because without them we have no, no salvation, no hope. And realize that life is to be lived, and we'll, we'll wrap this up, God willing, First week of November, life is to be lived to the glory of God alone. To live it any other way 
is to live what John Piper calls a wasted life. It's a wasted life. And to live it any other way in America, which has more gospel light shining upon it, has had more gospel light shined upon it, means to face the hottest of hells that there is in hell. We need to recover the Reformation. We need to recognize that we are reformers. That's what God's called us to be in this day and age. As we push the gospel and take the gospel to the ends of the earth and take it to our own nation, there's something we need to reform. Reformation means to bring back to a previous shape. And Christianity in America today desperately needs a reforming, a reformation, a new reformation. So I'm grateful that across this country, uh, in different ways, shapes, and forms, some of the greatest men you and I admire are having conferences on the Reformation. People are putting new emphases on the Reformation. You can buy a little Martin Luther doll on Amazon. Sadly, you can also buy a Martin Luther King mug on Amazon in remembrance of the Reformation. And Martin Luther King had nothing to do with the Reformation. There's a renewed emphasis is what I'm saying. So I hope we can use these times to look at the scriptures, to look at these truths, to provoke one another to love and good works. If, you, if, you've, if your history is rusty on it, it'll be, uh, the rust will be chipped off. If you've not known this before, we can welcome you into the context, our, our historical, theological context as Christians. And I hope as we move through this that you'll realize that being a Baptist is not just a choice. Being a Baptist is the inevitable outcome of following the gospel recovered in the Reformation to its biblical conclusions. So, God being our helper, Sunday night, tonight, we're going to look at a video on Sola Scriptura. It'll be a discussion by Al Mohler, Trevin Wax, Kevin DeYoung on the importance of the authority of Scripture. We close with this. Everybody has an authority. It may be the feeling you get in your stomach after you eat certain foods, but it's your authority. It's how you measure what is right, what is wrong. It may be what my mama told me. Well, my mama always said, well, that's good if mama got her authority right. Well, it's what I read. Well, that's good if, if, if what you read comes from the unchanging eternal word of God. So here's a question I want to leave you with when we get ready to study tonight. What is your authority for life? What is that unchanging, long-standing body of truth that influences the decisions you make in life. Because we all have authorities. We all have them. My prayer is for this church and for those we influence in the way that your authority will be the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Sola Scriptura. Come back tonight and we'll study that. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for men and women in ages past that you have helped to see the truth, that you emboldened to stand for the truth, that you convinced that your word is ultimate truth and that all truth must be tested by your truth, if it's going to be called truth. We're thankful that we are heirs of the Reformation. And we grieve because we live in a nation that has so much gospel privilege, has been shown so much gospel light, and yet we hear echoing every day in every way, we will not walk in those old paths. We will not pay attention. We will not listen. The blatant, intentional assault upon you, your goodness, your grace, your holiness, your word, the assault upon your precious son, the assault upon your church. God, please do not find us asleep in the light. Stir us, Lord, to rise up as men and women of God, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church militant, 
committed to advance your gospel, no matter where that takes us and what the cost might be to us. Father, in this day, 2017, help us to be part of a new reformation, a new recovery of the gospel of Jesus Christ that will push back all the darkness that masquerades itself as an alternative way to live. I pray for those here today who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, who have been sucked into no telling what kind of position. Oh God, may your word come to them as light shining in the darkness, convicting and convincing them of sin, convincing them that Jesus Christ is a willing and able Savior of every sinner who will come by faith to him. That you'll save the lost here today. That you'll make us disciples who are committed to making disciples, to engaging people in the neighborhoods, in the nations around the world, in the workplace, in the schoolyard, with truth, infallible truth, truth that sets the captive free. Stir us, O oh Lord, like you stirred Luther of old, Wycliffe, Huss, Hubmeyer, Bateson, Zwingli. Stir us, O oh God, and raise up from this place reformers who will repair the walls, restore the breaches, make clear the old paths, walking in them and pointing others to them. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.